Well, welcome to the first centenary inaugural lecture hosted by the College of Science and Engineering and to the first held virtually. Inaugural lectures are a cause for celebration and are an important occasion for the university where we acknowledge the promotion of colleagues to professor. They're also a wonderful opportunity to hear about an exciting body of research conducted over many years and to consider the impact of that research within the wider community. They're also an opportunity to reflect on, on the future directions of a subject. And I know that colleagues are joining us from locally and from around the world um, to hear the lecture. I'm really looking forward to hearing more from Joe, but before then, please can I ask Professor Lu Lu, the Head of School of Informatics, to introduce our inaugural speaker, Professor Zhou Zhu. Uh, good evening. I'm Professor Lu Liu, uh, Head of Schools uh, of Informatics. Uh, first of all, I would like to briefly introduce my colleague, uh, Professor Zhu, uh, to you. Professor Hui Yu Zhou received a Bachelor of Engineering degree in Radio Technology from Huazhong University of Science and Technology, China and a Master of Science degrees in Biomedical Engineering from University of Dundee. He was awarded a PhD in Computer Vision from Hewitt World University, Edinburgh. Professor Zhou is currently a full-time professor at the University of the Leicester. He has published over 300 peer-reviewed papers in his field. He was the recipient of the several prestigious international awards. Professor Zhou is also serving as editor-in-chief of recent advance in electrical and electronic engineering. He is associate editor for a number of the reputable journals. He has given over 100 invited talks at international conferences, industries, and universities. He has uh, served as a chair for 70 international conferences and workshops, and his research work has been supported by UK Research Council and leading industries. I'm not going to take more time. Now I would like to invite Professor Joe to deliver his lectures entitled Dealing with Uncertainty in Image Analysis. Thank you, Sally. Thank you, Lou, for introducing me to the audience. I'm going to share my slides here. Before I go ahead, can I ask you, you can see my slides on the screen, can you? Okay, and um, I also like to thank that Woody guest to come today for these um, inaugural lectures. And my name is Joe from the School of Informatics. Today, the, the titles of my talk is that Dealing with an Uncertainty in Image Analysis. To improve the interaction between you and me, I'd like to start with the questions here. And hopefully you can help me to do this exercise. And this question is like this. Do you think the flowers belong to the same class? I'm going to give you the 10 seconds to, to finish this exercise. After the 10 seconds, I'm going to review the answers to you. OK, and um, as you can see, that I have the answers on the bottom of this slide. On the left hand side, we have the iris worthy color. In the middle, so we have this uh, iris uh, setosa. Uh, on the right hand side, we have the iris uh, virginica. Obviously, they belong to the different uh, classes. Usually, when we look at the flowers, what kind of uh, features or descriptors we can use to identify individuals the flowers? Um, we usually uh, rely on uh, the couple of uh, key organs here. And one is called a petal, the other one is a sepal. And when we look at these flowers, uh, we mainly measure the petals, the length and width, and the sepals, length and width as well. 
to generalize this thing, flowers case the two different uh, objects. We would consider as a mathematical, mathematical is the terminology, if you like. Uh, this is called as a classification model. Uh, normally, in this case, um, I'm going to use the example naive database to convince you um, from now on. And for those people who don't have any, any ideas about the naive database, and I'm going to show you these uh, equations. On the screens, you can see and we have the posteriors and equivalent to the likelihood times the prior divided by this evidence. To give it more details and posteriors that refers to the probability of unknowns that quantity. In our case, we were talking about the flower, so the quantity here is the flower. And the likelihood is the, is the probability of the best guess on the flower. The prior is the probability of our belief on the unknown quantity, which is unknown flower. And the evidence there is the probability of the observation. In our case, that's the flower image. So for those of the people who really enjoy mathematics, I'm going to give you the more uh, details here. And before I give you the details, I'd like to say give some of the notation. The CJs refers to one of the three the flowers classes. Uh, in our flower cases, we have the three different classes. And A1, A2, and AN refers to the attribute of features. And here's the N is equivalent to four because we talk about the petal and sepals, length and width. So um, I'm going to use the highlighter here and hopefully that's the help. Okay. And um, if we want to estimate the flowers classes then, probability given the four the attributes of features. And this is uh, refers to the posteriors. And then we're going to calculate the likelihood using this uh, um, equation. And um, given the CJ, we're going to calculate the probability of AI. This is the for the likelihood. And um, in terms of the price, uh, we're going to have that is uh, CJ is the probability. And the evidence is the joint probability of a1 to a n. So some people may ask me, and we have such the classification model, and that's the beautiful mathematics. However, can we really use this the classification and apply this classification model or the mathematical and equations that to different images analysis task? Yes, we can. And we're going to stand and show you a few examples using base. The first example is called an object detection. What we actually do is we continuously compare the region of interest against the temperature by sliding the windows. On the right hand side, you can see that we continuously slide this green window from top to bottom in order to detect the phase of ordures that happen. And some people may see that I got some reference on the bottom. And this is about a outpost detection in SART images using um, Bayer system. The second example is uh, related to the object tracking. Um, the target is to select the areas that are most similar to the regions of our interest. On the right hand side, so we have the three human subjects walking around. And then what we do is uh, we wish to continue to track these uh, three persons in this uh, cluster environment. The job is not that easy in terms of the image analysis because we continuously suffer from the occlusion. Um, this type of work that I, and we already published in on the 2020 the TIP. In that case though, we were investigating grayscale thermals the tracking using sparse representation. The next uh, example is that it's about the image segmentation. What is the image segmentation here? Image segmentation is we wish to assign image pixels to, to the label groups with the similar characteristics. On the right hand side, I'm going to use the one of the examples here. And um, when you look at this uh, second columns, we wish to segment this the motorcycle from the background. 
And as you can see, the first row refers to the original image, and the second row is the output of, of our proposed system. And the last columns, the last row to indicate on the ground truth. This is the human labeling result. Um, this works the student under the peer review we submitted to the top conference. At the moment, it's still under uh, peer review. It will be reviewed soon with the result. So in the last 10 minutes time, I sh show you quite a few examples related to live base. And probably you asked me that, can we generalize all these examples to the different category and so on and so forth. And um, in this talk, because the time limits, I only be able to show you the three use cases, video surveillance and animals monitoring and remote sensing. For each use cases, I have a three or four subtasks. Each task, uh, we build up a self-contained strategy using the based framework. So what we actually do is I'm going to start from the first use case, video surveillance. For this video surveillance, and I have the five um, study cases or use cases if you, if you like. We start from the gender recognition and age classification and followed by the human detection and tracking. And after we got this the human detection and tracking the result, then we build up this trajectory analysis and we try to stay cluster this trajectory. And afterwards, then we used some um, system called a event detection system to wrap up all the components we have done so far. I like to stay give you the motivation why we do this work with this awareness. In 2020s um, in the UK, we have around 5.2 million cameras. And the use of these the cameras is to prevent this and privacy in public places. And as we know, um, based on the statistics, about 70% of offenders are young, adolescents and males. They are teenagers, it's a male. And to narrow down research for these offenders, and our research questions are, what is the age and gender of the target? And then what this guy is doing at that moment? I'd like to give you this uh, demonstration for the event detection on bus. This work was conducted there when I was working in Queen's University of Belfast. As you can see, one male passenger the board bus and came into this the bus cage. And then you can see the red dots that on the screen is showing the, the seat number. And the right hand side is the bottom, so you can see on the gender and the seat number showing on the screen. And later on, the female passengers are coming on board, and the male passengers that uh, come forward and sit beside her. And on the right, the left hand side, you can see these two red uh, squares that showing that the two passengers they sit by side by side. After a few seconds, and um, we can see this then female passengers that left the bus, and the male passengers follow this female uh, and off the bus as well. And on the bottom of the left hand side, you can see that we have this uh, um, composite the events that pop up that the passengers see intimidation. And that just uh, simulates that what's going on here. It's the real case. And what we actually see from this the demo is, um, as you can see, that we have uh, quite a few components that play in the place. And one is the um, gender classification and also trajectory analysis and on and off the bus. And then we also know and whether or not that person to sit down or just uh, come into the other different seat. This is slide to show you the, the gender recognition. What we actually do, we want to detect the gender of the subject. On the left hand side, I show you this that demo. Um, this demo actually is, can be split into the three different stages. The first stage is show you this. It seems to be a male working, isn't it? And the second stage is show you there's something not sure Maybe it's the male, maybe it's not, maybe it's a female. And the further stage, obviously, it is linked with the females working. As I said before, um, in the second stage, 
and there's a transition and you're not sure this is a male or female is working and we want to uh, identify this is uh, definitely is the male or female we want to know that how to do that and in our approach what we su supposed to do is that we want to consider the different attributes and the different attributes include uh, on the first row of, the, of your right hand side and uh, you can see that uh, we pick up the full body of the individual subject and then i'm not sure that you can see this and they we have this uh, body gradients um, we also have the uh, we have the two the female and male subject and then we have the body's gradients on top of this the slides and then on the bottom of this slide we have this uh, histogram of principal components analysis and this is the from the face area of that is the two individuals the subject we basically just uh, combine this then um, face measurements and the full body measurements in the boosting the framework in order to improve the classification outcome previously we talked about the gender recognition now we come to this uh, age classification and the age classification uh, task is meant to be allow us to, to identify the age of the subject. On the screen there, you can see we have the, the on the first row we have the four different images, and these are four different images then related to the months, four years, seven years, and fourteen years for the same subject. On the second row, as you can see, that we apply these the different set of a Gaussian. The reason why we do that because we want to remove the lighting then and impact. On the third rows of this, and we can see this is the outcome of a random transform. The reason why we do this a random transform because we want to remove the rotations, the, the impact in, in the same place that rotation, okay? And the last rows, it shows that the support vector machines, the classification outcome with a feature selection. We only select those the features that positively contribute to this uh, age classification. And so far, so we have done the two things. We have the two components. In, previ in the previous slides, we did is an age classification, uh, sorry, the gender classification, and the current standard slides, we did is an age classification. And these are the two components that give you the genders and age outcome. And now let's move on to this uh, human detection and tracking. And as you, if you still remember what's going on with the advanced demos, uh, we mainly focus on the human subject. And on these the present slides, how are we going to do this uh, human detection and tracking? As we already know, traditional human detection and tracking strategies mainly use visual measurements. On the screen here, the first row and the second row is the outcome of the two visual measurement based strategies. One is called a particle the filter, the other one is called a graph the matching strategies. And if you can take a close look at these the images, in the middle of these images, you can see when these the subjects that hide themselves behind the barriers, and these the particle and graph that matches the models will not be able to pick this the subject up. Why? Because we lost the visual contact. How are we going to do that? And once these the subjects that make any sound audios behind the barrier, then we can apply the audio detection. And we use it as the time of the arrival strategy to detect the audios. And our strategy has the novelty of combining these visual measurements with the audio detection in the particle filter and then produce the better the outcome. As you can see, so on the last row, in the middle of the images, and we pick up these then subjects as well, because then these guys they pre, uh, make the same uh, audio is that behind the barrier, and then we can pick them up. Now so let's move into this uh, trajectory clustering. Uh, this uh, trajectory clustering allows us to understand the passengers uh, on the bus and he or she is then walking towards the bus center or off the bus. 
Yes. On the screen, so on the left hand side, you can see we have a four or different trajectory indicated by different color. The red color, pink color, and green color, and the blue color. And usually when the people want to identify the different uh, working trajectory, then they can use the different features. The first features we can use it is the distance, the different features. We only look at the distance, distance between the two neighbors, the samples. And if we use this the distance, the difference, the features, then we will be able to separate the blue color and green color from the red color and the pink color. You can look at the, the bottom of this slide, the right in the, the middle of the images. On the other case, um, if we use the directions, deviation, the features, we look at the direction of each the trajectory, and then, as you can see, we can separate the red colors from blue color, green color, and the pink color. So, you probably ask yourself, and if I have that many, many different features, why not just combine all these features together, and then I can produce a much satisfactory result. That's correct. And if you think along this line, that's a wonderful idea. Um, we actually do that. And how are we going to do that? And we used, and we actually did combine the 22 different features and combine these the 22 different features in the frameworks of Markov train Monte Carlo. Well, you probably hear this the, in a strange way, but when Markov train Monte Carlo is the strategies we are using here. And this the Markov train Monte Carlo's strategies that have the two important the variables. Uh, on the right hand side, the most right hand side, top of right hand side, you can see we have the two, uh, two the sub figures. Uh, we call this the plus of the rule and the mu. And this the rules and mu actually refers to the two key the features in the Markov chain multi -colors. And as you can see, as these iterations that goes up, and this uh, rule and mu that become this convergent. On the right hand side, the bottom of the right hand side, we can see this uh, two sub figures. One is called the ground truth, and the other one is uh, proposed the outcome. The ground truth uh, actually is, the, is labeled by human, by experts, and created by the um, experts. And we have the different colors here, and four different colors indicate a different uh, trajectory as well. And the proposed algorithms, the outcome is quite good. In fact, and um, our the systems that produce uh, about 98% uh, accuracy. The use case two, animal modeling. For this uh, second uh, use case, we were mainly focusing on mouse detection and tracking. And here is the it's animal mouse. It's not the uh, computer's mouse. And we also look at this mouse behavior recognition as well, followed by the multiple the view mouse behavior recognition. And later on, I'm going to explain to you what's going on here, why we do this animal mouse, the detection, tracking, and behavior recognition. The motivation of this research work, of this use case, we are looking at this Parkinson's disease. We know that Parkinson's disease is a progressive, uh, progressive neurological condition and getting worse over the time. And currently in the UK, so we have about one out of the 500 people affected by Parkinson's disease. And usually it's then what we do is and in order to develop the drug, in order to make these then drugs that developments, we look at these mouse phenotypes. We look at the mouse behaviors. What we actually do is and we basically just say, fit the mouse with the drugs that we got so far and try to understand whether or not the drugs that is effective to the mouse. So what we actually do is when we um, use the people to observe the mouse behavior before and after you applied the drugs to the mouse. Um, obviously we understand um, this is kind of the human assessment and it's quite tedious and sometimes uh, quite complicated. In order to reduce the limitation of a human's assessment in terms of the time, cost, and reproductibility, and we want to come up with some 
and automated solutions. We want to develop a system which they allow us to measure the mouse behaviors automatically. This is what we want to do. So in order to do that, um, in our studies, uh, we have, as I said before, we have the three different uh, subtasks. The first one is the detection and tracking of mice. And in this case, the, we have um, look at these the multiple mice. And on the bottom of these images, we have these the, what we call these uh, mouse videos. And in the scenes there, we have the, well, you can put in some one, two, three uh, different uh, mice in the scenes. Once you get these the videos, and we separate this video into individual step frame, and then we produce this the part proposal network. This is the deep learning architecture, and showing on the top left hand side. And once we get this then part proposal the networks working, then these the networks are producing two channels outputs. One channel is called is a and heads and tail channels, and this is the and networks are producing the raft position of the heads and tails individually. The other channel is called a body proposal of the channel, and we produce the, these the bodies, the position in the images roughly. And for each channel, and we used deep learning architecture again, and in order to identify the head and tail and body position in the images accurately. So on the Top right hand side, so you can see this um, past candidates that has been available, and the body candidate also available too. Once we have these uh, three different August uh, positions in the images, then what we actually use here, we propose the past associations the strategy. This is the base basins the framework, and we want to build up the connection between the images, and in order to produce the final outcome for this uh, tracking. And um, in this the slides, then, as you can see, so we have the, some of the demos for the mice the tracking. In the sense, we have the three different mice. And then um, what we actually do is um, we want to stay track, continuously to track the individual mice. And we want to estimate the which um, strategy, strategy produce the best outcome. On the first rows, on the left hand side, we have the ground cheese. Uh, this is provided by the human experts. Experts, and on the right hand side, top right hand side, this is the outcome of, of our proposed strategy. On the bottom, we have the two legacy technologies outcome. And if you carefully look at this color, and um, obviously you can see the, the color of the ground truth and the color of the proposed algorithms is quite similar. So that means then these are the two outcomes that looks very close indicating that our proposed system performs much better than the legacy technologies here. So the next subtask we're going to introduce here is a mouse behavior recognition. Um, in terms of the machine learning, um, the new contribution in this case is we want to identify the mouse behaviors then continuously for each the image. So and here, so we propose a new hidden Markov models. And these the hidden Markov models are working in such way. And these are the models that need required two probability to support. One probability is called a transition probability. The other one is called a emission probability. The transitions to probability, you can get is the outcomes from the images itself. And the images that is the video of the mouse motion. OK, so what we actually do is that on the bottom of these the slides, I show this the video sequences that come in. Once we get this the mouse videos coming in, this is only refers to the one single mouse. I have to remind you here. And we separate these the videos into the frame by frame. And once we get this the frame by frames, and then we separate into the two channels, the left hand, left -hand side channel, you can see we extract the interest points that and then we get these uh, visual sub features and followed by the Gaussian mixture model in order to produce the feature vector for these uh, visual features. On the right hand side, then we make this uh, frame difference thing working and then we produce 
contextual features followed by the Gaussian mixture model. And also we produce the features, the vector as well. But we compare these the two different feature vectors. The left hand side, we, uh, we call this a feature vector, uh, features features. On the right hand side, we call this a contextual features. Once we got these the two different feature vectors, we put them into the segments, the aggregated network. This is the light deep learning architecture we proposed for this particular work. And then these the segments, the aggregated networks produce emission probability using the based rules. To look at the, the outcome of this the proposed approach, um, on the screen that showed the table, um, we probably we don't need to discuss the one by one. And on the screen, um, we can see this IDT and TDT on the left, left hand side. We also show you the hours and combined strategies. And uh, this is the four different strategies. And the combined strategy indicates we combine the hours with the tradition on the IDT and TDD um, individually. And on the right hand side, but the most of the right hand side that you can see this uh, bold colors indicating the outcome of the proposed system. Um, if you look at the combined outcomes, it can achieve 97.9%. Compared to Dollar and Jay Huang, which is seen on the bottom of this the slide, and they are using the support vector machine to produce the accuracy. And as you can see, the, our strategies achieve them a 97.9 percentages accuracy, which means that our system is much better. So let's come to this the demo. This demo that actually show you the behavior recognition using our proposed approach. Um, the text we put online is actually the outcome of our automated system. And now it changed to the head. After this, this the mouse to turn around and start working, and then um, it becomes the groom and so on and so forth. So this is the text this is the automated the outcome from our system. And this is the four hours of video, if I remember this correctly. And we achieved around 80% accuracy compared to the legacy the technology, which only reached 72% the accuracy. Our the strategy, obviously, much, much better. Okay, and um, now let's look at this the uh, multi views. Um, mouse behavior recognition. As I said before, and um, in the previous slides, we talk about a single view mouse behavior recognition. And we know that when the mouse the turn around and then got the accretion problem, then the, our system cannot identify the performance of the mouse on the other side because it is only got the one single camera, right? So now so let's look at this, the multi view mouse behavior recognition. We use the three cameras actually in our system. What we do is um, on the bottom of this the slide, um, we have this day and the videos coming in uh, from the different cameras. And then once we get this the videos coming in, we separate the video into individual image frames. And afterwards, uh, we have the two blocks. One is called A blocks, the left hand side, and the other blocks are called B blocks on the right hand side. On the A blocks, what we actually do is we try to produce these uh, trajectory based motion features using the convolutional neural network. Again, you probably is then um, say, wow, is a uh, neural networks again? Yes, that's it. And we use the CNN to produce the feature maps. And afterwards, then we use the Gaussian mixture model to produce the feature vector for these uh, motion features. On the B blocks, we have this uh, feature called the spatial temperature features. And we already indicate, explained this uh, spatial temperature features in the previous uh, slide. So actually it's produced uh, the features, features and contextual features as well. And suppose that we have uh, these uh, three features and vectors ready. One is the uh, motion feature, one is the uh, visual vector uh, features, and then the, the other one is the uh, contextual features. And then we send these three different uh, feature vectors into the graphical models, which is shown on the top left hand side. And then after these uh, graphical models, uh, we produce 
ethograms. What is the ethogram here? Yeah. And the ethograms indicate the plots of uh, social behaviors against time. On this slide, I'm going to show you the result of our proposed multi-views mouse behavior recognition. This is a colonus grams of branches and our methods. The individual staccato bars indicating the social behaviors. For example, the approach, chase and drink, and so on and so forth. Different color indicated different social behaviors. Um, we actually have uh, three columns on the screen. The most right-hand side is the color indicated ground cheese. This is the produced by human experts. And the first and the second columns on the screen and show you our methods without a labels and correlation or our methods with label correlation. When I said without a label correlation, that means then unsupervised learning. With a label correlation, that means the supervised learning. So again, it's quite clear to me, our methods with the supervised learning achieved the best outcome because it looks so much, so near and so close to the ground truth, isn't it, on the screen? Okay, now let's come to the, our the final the use case remote sensing and um, this the remote sensing the use case actually is they contain um, the three the different uh, um, different stand sub tasks one is called uh, anomaly detection in hyperspectral images and the second one is uh, hyperspectral and uh, missing and the final one is and um, dimensionality reduction using the tensor graph What is it? And as we know, the remote sensing is helping us to monitor the physical property of the regions underground by measuring the its refraction at a long distance. And usually we can collect this image from the satellite or aircraft. On the right hand side, we have the video. Uh, this video is showing you the Severance uh, rovers uh, touchdown to the Mars uh, produced by NASA. That's great to movie, isn't it? And that shows that I was then in NASA's um, rovers already touched down to the Mars. And in the first uh, subtask, what we do is uh, we do this uh, anomaly detection in hyperspectral images. The goal of this work is to detect the targets of interest or anomaly different from the contextual clues in the scene. So you probably ask me, you know, what is the strategy? Why this strategy uh, is new? And we actually then construct the two well designed dictionary here. One is called a background, and one is called a potential anomaly dictionary. On the right hand side, I show you this then uh, and short video, and uh, that's just to show you in a football pitch uh, with a lot of green colors, and uh, sometimes that uh, you can see this white color as well. Uh, this is what we call as a background then, dictionary. Okay, I'm using this as a simple example to explain what happens then in our strategy. And then you can see that uh, running the football players, the players on the page, and this is what we call the potential anomaly dictionary. Okay. Next time when you see the, some strange the items or additional the items that come into the scene, you can compare this the strange the item against the football pitch. That refers to the background dictionary, and you also can compare these uh, additional the items against the players the dictionary and see which one that belongs to. OK, this is our uh, approach. So how to make this the uh, system work? And suppose that we have the hyperspectral images comes in, then we're going to use the principle of the components analysis to reduce the dimensionality of the raw images. And then we use this k-means technologies 
in order to cluster the old images into in different groups. But once we get these different groups of the pixels, and then we send them into the blocks called joins the sparse representation. These are blocks that actually stay decompose the images pixels into the different uh, matrices. And afterwards, then we're going to build up this background dictionary or potential anomaly dictionary. And this the slide just shows you the examples that experiment the result of our approach. And the first column indicate the raw images and the column four indicate the backgrounds the images that collected by our approach and highlighted by the yellow color. And the column fifth indicating these the, the what we call this anomaly detection. And we want to detect the aircrafts on the ground. So this is the aircraft that has been highlighted by yellow color. The second day subtask in this use case is called a hyperspectral state and missing. What we actually do here is like this. We use the remote sensors to look at the ground subject. And then the remote sensing images that usually is indicating refractions from the different uh, wavelengths. Uh, as you can see on the left hand side, the border images indicate that uh, we have the different, different uh, wavelengths and outcome. And then these uh, different uh, wavelengths that actually is the combination of the several the components of the spectrum. On the right hand side, so you can see this uh, vegetation has particular the shape and the background soil has different shape and so on and so forth. So the importance of the left hand side actually is the mixture of the right hand side images. What we actually do here is that we wish to use the observation from the remote sensor in order to separate these the different materials, different components. Is that possible? Yes, that's possible. And our proposed strategy works like this. We have the incoming state images, and then we apply the k-means state clustering in order to separate into the different groups. And in this case, we actually use the k. Uh, this is k is a value that serving this k-means. So we have to carefully choose k. And how to get this the beautiful k, proper k, and then we use the high seams algorithm. This is standard algorithm to create this the k. And once we pass this the images the through this k means clustering, then we get the colorful the images outcome. And out of these the colorful images outcome, then we want to apply the standard edge uh, detection strategy to detect the edges map. Once we come to this the edge map, um, now we think we, we think so the story. Um, we wish to produce the two regions. One region is called a homogeneous region. The other one is called a detailed region. OK, so if we, we want to get this homogeneous region, what methods we can use? And um, we are using this sparse non-negative matrix factorization method. And in order to get this detailed regions, we want to use graph regularized bilinear model. So once we get these the two regions, and then we combine the first or the uh, abundance of the matrix, and finally produce the, and the outcome. On the bottom of this the slide, as you can see, we have a different color indicated, different uh, regions, the different materials as well. And this is slides just to show you the examples of experimental results. And on the first columns indicating the lower images, the second columns indicating the k-means, and the final columns indicated the boundary map of the outcome. Of this is on the bottom the right hand side, you can see that we have a lot of the edges here. Uh, this is may cause the problems later on. And however, we haven't figured out how to handle this uh, clutters than seen. So the last, I think the last and the last subtask uh, in this use case is called a tensor based graph for dimensionality reduction. As we know, then we use the remote sensing to collect the images. And these the remote sensors that usually create the large data volume. And obviously these the data volumes that cause challenges to the data processing systems. 
What they actually do in this the subtask, we propose a new strategy. These are pr proposed strategies works in the ways it used the low ranks the constraint to keep the global data structure. In the meantime, we use the tensor analysis to preserve the space of neighboring the information. That's for the details. And later on, then we also apply the multis manifolds the method to preserve the local regions. And this is called a geometric property. The reason why we do that is because we want to, and um, you keep the big structure of the images. In the meantime, you also start hold on these uh, details. And the proposed methods that it looks like this. I'm going to just give you a quick through. Uh, we have these images coming in, then we vectorize these images. And follow that, or we apply the multi manifolds, the regularizations the methods. The reason why we do that because we want to transfer the, these the images into the different state, uh, matrices. And on the bottom of these the slides, we have uh, uh, quite a few complicated uh, mathematical handling. So eventually, we produce these the tensors. Uh, we call this the tensor maps. And finally, we got this uh, classification outcome on the bottom left. In this the slides, uh, I'm going to show you this, some examples uh, and expand the result. Um, on the first row, the first one, first column indicating the raw images, and the second column on the first row, they're indicating this the human labor and result. Um, on the second columns, then the most right hand side is indicating the outcome of our proposed approach. And compared to the other the approaches, the outcome, our approach is, has very clean the outcome and also very good, very accurate the thing, and, and the very good the accuracy. So I'm sure that you got this the quite a lot of the information today. And in this slides, I'm going to use the show the summary. And the take home of the message is we now investigate the basin. And the basins they can be used to model uncertainty in the classification problems. And um, in these uh, talks, we only cover a part of the application of a basis approaches. And this include the video surveillance, animal modeling, and remote sensing. Uh, in the meantime, so now we know our approach has achieved very good the result and satisfactory accuracy. However, we haven't addressed efficiencies challenge yet. Um, I know that in these August lectures, I need to report the, where they come from. And in these slides, I'm going to show you the, my academic journey. And from the 1999 to the 2006, I was conducting the PhD study um, under the Professor Patrick, Patrick Green and Andrew Wallace at Hedwell University. And from the 2004 to 2006, I was the, doing the research assistant job and for the stroke rehabilitation at University of Essex. At that time, I was working with the Professor Hu. Um, from 2006 to 2007, I was working with the Professor Andrew Cavallaro at Queen Mary University of London. At that time, it's a um, multi camera tracking project I was involved. And from the 2007 to 2009, I was a postdoc working with the Professor Abdul Sarkas at Brunei University of London. Uh, at that time, that, that was the EU project entitled the retrieval of a multimedia semantic units for enhanced reusability. From 2009 to 2012, I was a research engineer working at Center for Secure Information Technologies and under the supervision of uh, Dr. Paul Miller at Queen's University of Belfast. From 2012 to 2017, I was a lecturer working at the School of Electronics, Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at Queen's University of Belfast. And finally, so from 2018 up to now, I'm readers and professor now at School of Informatics. Finally, so before you go away, I'd like to acknowledge the support from the different research councils and EPSRC and in the UK, Research England, and invest in Northern Ireland, Newton Fund, and so on and so forth. I also like to take this opportunity to thank my research team 
I'd like to thank the, all the research collaborators and my family members for their continuous the support. Without this the support, I couldn't make this the achievement. And finally, so let me uh, thank the all the guests uh, today for your comings. And if you have any questions that we can discuss offline. Now I have finalized uh, my talk. Let me just uh, hand it over to Sarah, please. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Joe, for that enlightening inaugural lecture. Um, and in the summertime, when we've just got summer here in the UK, it was wonderful to start off with those beautiful examples of viruses before moving on to the more challenging and important research areas that really show the breadth and depth of your research. And given that there are 5.2 million cameras in the UK last, or last year, that, you know, the approaches you're doing do affect us all. And I think the range of approaches you demonstrated indicates the complexity required in that image analysis and that detection tracking. And it was wonderful to, as well to see um, how your work is impacting on um, understanding the assessment and improving on the limitations of human assessment of things like Parkinson's disease. As you'll know, remote sensing and earth observation have a long history here at Leicester and the downstream applications of EO data and the interpretation of those images will be really important for a whole um, raft of achievements and things that we need to do using that remote sensing data. So thank you very much again for your talk. As is customary, as you've mentioned, there are no questions following inaugural. So those of us that do have uh, questions, we'll be able to discuss with you offline and hopefully in person in, in the future. So all that remains for me to do is to say thank you very much well done and many many congratulations joe on your promotion to professor here at the university of leicester and for presenting to us your fantastic body of research thank you and to all our listeners and viewers good night <laughs>